Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Gail Powley. I'm president of Technology Alberta, and it's our pleasure to have a company showcase once a month at this wonderful AI seminar. Uh, Technology Alberta's mandate is to help, it's a community that helps support the growth of the tech sector in the province by providing growing tech companies everything they need, including amazing Alberta talent. Uh, we want to keep this talent here to grow our companies like Intuit, which has an amazing story. It's a world class uh, brand and so pleased to have them joining us here today. So, with that, I will turn it over to fellow. University of Alberta Computer Science Industry Advisory Board member, Greg Kulum of Intuit. Over to you, Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Gail. So really happy to be here. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so so let's let's uh, let's get started. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of AI at Intuit, specifically as we as we as it touches our team here in Edmonton. Uh, you know, and so I'm going to give a little bit of context on Intuit as a company and who you're here to listen to, and then I'm going to actually hand it over to uh, Horace, who's the and Andrew, who are the experts. So, uh, as Gail mentioned, my name is Greg Coulomb. I'm a director of software development based here in Edmonton, uh, and I, I lead teams in our uh, futures organization where we are evaluating emerging technology for how it can be used in our products. Uh, I'm joined by Horace Chan, who's a software development manager in our conversational experiences team, and Andrew Matarella Mickey, who is a data scientist who in our Intuit AI organization, who has worked very closely with Horace and I over the years on the things you're going to see here today. So with that, uh, let me give you a bit of context uh, on Intuit itself. Uh, we like to refer to ourselves as a 35-year-old startup. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the story goes that our founder, Scott Cook, uh, was watching his wife do their, do their balance or checkbook, I think it was, uh, sitting around the kitchen table 35 years ago, and he thought, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so he partnered, he and his partners basically came up with, uh, at the time, Quicken, which was our first product. And, you know, the, the, the rest is history, as they say. And we've been working to revolutionize uh, finances and financial um, uh, lives of people since then. Uh, you may know us by our products more than by our brand. Uh, we we tend to be that way. Uh, you know, really quickly, we have uh, QuickBooks, which is our flagship small business product to, uh, to help uh, companies with their, their bookkeeping and, uh, you know, cash flow management. We have TurboTax, which I hope you all are using right about now to actually do your taxes. Uh, if you're not, you should, because Canadian taxes are really, really easy uh, and you can do them yourself. Uh, we also have Mint, which is for tracking and managing your personal finances. And then our two newest companies that have joined us over the last year and a half, uh, Credit Karma, which is for uh, uh, reporting and learning about your credit, credit scores, as well as MailChimp, which joined us most recently and to help small businesses with marketing and engaging with their customers. So you can see we have a pretty broad range of, of um, customers that we serve in, this, uh, in the financial space. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Our mission overall as a company, uh, and I love this actually, is to power prosperity around the world. Uh, you know, I, I, and I like this mission because it's not, it doesn't speak to any specific product or specific task that people do or anything like this, but it speaks to this sort of built-in human need to be prosperous. And that, you know, whether that's financial prosperity or other forms of prosperity, we see it as part of our mission to help you be successful in those areas. And so this, you know, it helps uh, all of us add into it really feel guided by what our customers need. It's, that's central to how we work. Uh, our, and really quickly at a, at a strategy, I'm not gonna spend any time here. Our mission, uh, our, our strategy, sorry, is to be what we call an AI driven expert platform where we can actually bring the best of technology and AI together as well as the best of human expertise together with, you know, to, in order to give our customers more money uh, without requiring a bunch of work from them and to have them be confident along the way. Um, I, I could spend literally hours and people have spent literally hours talking about all different aspects of this slide, but it just goes to show that, you know, AI is kind of at the, at the foundation of what we do at Intuit and it pervades everything. And I think what you're going to hear today is a good um, microcosm of how we're doing that. Uh, really, really briefly about the company, like we're located all around the world. Uh, we've got, you know, about uh, 
depending on how you count, uh, somewhere between 10 and what, 30,000 employees or something like this, depending on who you count and how. Uh, here in Edmonton, we are in the Epcor Tower. We've got around 150 people here um, representing almost all of Intuit in all of our business units. Um, and one of the things I'm most proud of that I, I mentioned a minute ago is uh, we are like 25% early career here. You know, people within the first, say, one to three years of their career. Uh, and we've always done really, really well by the University of Alberta, whether it be through co-ops uh, or through um, uh, new grads. So we, and we love that. Um, you know, we are around the world, or, you know, well, rep well recognized employer. Uh, I think we are like the number two in Canada. I think the next slide, I think, has some of the data here. Um, you know, the, yeah, that's right, there it is. So as you can see, you know, in our major places around the world, Canada, the US, India, uh, you know, development centers are very, very well regarded. Uh, and so you know, we're very proud to work for Intuit and proud to share a little bit of what we do with you all. So I think with that, I'm going to uh, hand the virtual mic over to Horace to talk about the, the meat of our presentation today, which is our conversational experiences. So Horace, you wanna take it away? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Yeah, so um, yeah. My name is Horace Chan, and I'm the Software Development Manager for the Conversational Experiences team. And uh, I'm a proud uh, graduate of the Computer Engineering Program at the U University of Alberta as well. Um, I'm excited to share with you today um, uh, the, inter uh, the Intuit Conversational Experiences platform and a couple of examples where AIML delivers benefits for our users. For the Conversational Experiences team, our mission is to develop the tools and technology that enable personalized conversational experiences for Intuit products. We do that by building the platform that powers all the digital assistants, uh, chatbots, and the voice assistant, voice bots for Intuit products, such as TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Intuit call centers. The platform has three main pillars, conversation designer, a no-code, low-code offering tool for AI training, bot responses, and fulfillment logic that empowers business domain conversational experts to develop and deploy conversational experiences. The second pillar is a conversation runtime. This is the dialogue management executing the natural language understanding AI models and executing the designed logic and fulfills the bot responses with many enterprise service integrations. Finally, uh, there's conversational intelligence. This the, performs the bot data ingestion so that we could uh, provide the analytics and dashboards to continuously improve our, our conversational experiences. Now, let me show you uh, some short demos of how conversational experiences help Intuit users. First, I want to introduce you to the TurboTax assistant, an in-product chatbot in TurboTax Online that is always ready to answer, uh, answer users' questions. Let me play the video here. Uh, in this video, you're going to see the user in the TurboTax product um, has, has, uh, has the digital assistant open on the right-hand side. The user here, Gori, would like to chat with a specialist. TurboTax assistant can do that escalation conversationally. It first collects a few pieces of information about the user that was not currently in their profile. In case the user gets disconnected before uh, before we could connect, then the user puts in is put into the queue for the next available live live chat specialist. She can now get back to doing her taxes or ask the digital assistant another question. And you can see here, like now that she's been put into the queue, she could continue doing her taxes and, uh, and get out of the digital assistance. And on the right hand pane here, a TurboTax Live specialist, Nick, responds to the chat request. This will send an in app notification to Gori to begin the live chat session. So this is a small example where we could conversationally uh, uh, deliver an experience to the user uh, by, by having multi-turn conversation with the chatbots.
Next, I want to show you the intelligent voice assistant that helps users when they call, call into it on the phone to get quick personalized answers and route to the best specialist to help. It is powered by the same conversational experiences platform. And what you will see in this video is you'll hear a voice call and on the screen, you'll see the session transcript of the voice call, as well as on the bottom of uh, some bang boxes on, on some explanation of what's going on during this voice call in the back end. I'm gonna play the video now and it has a voiceover. Let me know if you can't hear it well. Thank you for calling into with QuickBooks. This call may be recorded. I was able to find an account using the number you're calling in on. Would you like me to use this for our conversation today? Yes. What is the name of the company that you're calling about today? Test company. Please tell me your first and last name. Greg Coulomb. If you need to speak with an expert, sign into your QuickBooks account and select the help icon on the top right. This is the only way to reach an expert. If you stay on the line with me, I can quickly give you steps and answers our experts use so you don't have to wait. Say, purchase a product if you'd like to purchase something. Otherwise, please tell me in a few words how I can help you today. I'd like to change my credit card number. I have some information on how to update your payment method. Would you like me to send this to you? Messaging and data rates may apply. Yes, please. Should I send a text message to the number that you're calling from? Yes. All right, I just sent you that link. Is there something else I can help you with today? No, thank you. Thank you for calling. Have a great day. Cool. Now that you've seen the products in action, I want to dive a little deeper into how it works. Um, when the user John chats with QuickBooks Assistant via our web, Android, or iOS clients, it, the message gets sent through a bi-directional messaging service that handles many types of rich message protocols and provides persistence for both the messages and the conversational context. Then the messages goes to a dialogue management service, which will use natural language understanding models to classify the intents and extract the entities from what the user said. Once we have the intents and entities, it executes conversational logic to fulfill the response with data from APIs and custom AI models. These logic and response and fulfillment were offered by the no-code, low-code uh, uh, conversation designer tool. And finally, the fulfilled bot message is sent back to the user. It's important to note that, um, that when, when we can't match a user utterance to a pre-trained, pre-offered intent, we call that fallback. And we'll discuss this a bit later on how we use question and answer AI models to help the user in that case. Now I want to share a couple examples where AI models help our users in conversational experiences. First is the model we call querulous search. Um, the customer problem that we're solving for here is customers get stuck completing tasks in complex domains, such as tax, accounting, and personal finance. They want fast resolution, but may not even know where to start or what to ask about the problem they have. Um, the solution we've come up with is across many experiences, querulous search models provides immediate answers based on user characteristics and behavior in the product without ever having to articulate a specific question. The QS model is uh, used to personalize the welcome message in digital assistants. Uh, so the users are presented with personalized conversational suggestions uh, such as the get ready for your end here, or help topic based on uh, her profile and in product behavior. Another use of this model is um, in voice assistance when, when um, in the welcome message to suggest help topics based on the same features. So some uh, features that this model uses is, is uh, to train this model, some, some features that it uses is the user profile, such as uh, product sign updates, tax filing status, and the number of dependents the, 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 the user may have in their tax profile. The other big set of features that are used are users' click streams within Intuit's products. This includes the action, the time, the screen, and the object they were interacting with in product. The model architecture is a deep neural net 
um, model leveraging LSTM for the clickstream features, concatenate it with a dense layer for the user features in order to rank the articles, uh, the, the relevant articles for, for that user. The curl, finally, the, the curlless search model can be generalized to many different use cases, such as predictive self-help search, voice assistant, and digital assistants. Um, this allows Intuit to leverage the investment to optimize, scale, and operate this model and deliver our user benefit in many products and, and services. And this is one case where um, it, uh, in, um, in production, like it's really important that we could generalize and, and scale these models to, to, to highly leverage them, highly leverage the investments. Next, I want, I want to share the question and answer model. Uh, the problem we're trying to solve here is customers ask, uh, ask the digital assistant, voice assistant, ask a long tail of very diverse questions. Um, previously, this is solved by either offering additional conversational content per topic that the user wants to talk about, or presenting customers with search results that they have to click through and find the answer. Um, the solution we came up with was to provide relevant in, inline answers to customers' questions automatically um, without manual offering by finding and displaying snippets from relevant articles. If you remember earlier, our fallback experience is basically the handler for when the general NLU cannot classify pre-trained intent to a certain threshold. Traditionally, we handle this by sending the user a list of search results for them to review and select. And that's the experience you're seeing on the left-hand side. So, uh, a user often has to click once or twice or three times to, to get to the answer they want. Um, with the question and answer model, we can search the top most relevant article and provide the most relevant snippets of article text in line to the answer, in line to the user, um, without the user ever having to let, leave their, the digital assistant experience. Uh, and that's what you're seeing on the right hand side, where it, there's an inline answer powered by the question and answer model. Um, so uh, I want to share with you a little bit of how Q&A works under the hood. Um, first, we get the uh, fallback question in the form of a customer utterance. Um, then we perform a search uh, of, of the um, uh, FAQ articles that we have and match it to the best match uh, questions, uh, match the user question to the best match question. Um, and if that search confidence exceeds a threshold, then we proceed to uh, find the highlights, the snippet highlights matching the, the article body uh, to snipping the article body with the relevant question. And again, if the, that uh, search, um, uh, if that snippet reaches an overall confidence that exceeds our threshold, then the snippet is presented to, uh, uh, to the user. Otherwise, it falls back to the uh, search API to prevent the, the search experience to the user. Um, at first, uh, the first task of searching for the most similar question, in this case, the user asked two-step verification. Um, we perform TFIDF on it to match it to the article, uh, uh, the article questions that we have in our, our, our database. Uh, and these are um, many thousands of uh, uh, FAQ questions that we've collected that are expert created. And we retrieve the top 10 article, top X articles that have the most relevant question match. On the next step, how, like, how do we rank the most similar questions after retrieving the top N articles? Remember, an article has a question and an answer. So we perform BERT, uh, we use the BERT transformer on it and choose the best article based on the, um, now use, uh, matching to the article text now, uh, choose the best article using cosine similarity. And finally, how do we choose, the, once we have the article we have in mind, how do we choose the uh, best snippet from that article? Um, we perform bag of words on it and find the most contextually similar sentences on the snippets. Finally, I want to touch briefly on how our AI routing models uh, are, are leveraged in the voice assistance. 
the customers, the customer problem we're solving here is customers call into it on the phone and have to go through a long series of questions. I'm sure all of you have experienced it. They um, ask you your name, phone number, uh, accounts, products, and what are you calling about today? Uh, before finally getting to the answer or a person that could answer your question. Um, the solution here is to answer the user's questions quickly by predicting the user's situation. And from, from a high level, the key challenge on the phone is that we know very little about the user that calls in. And then into it, one user can have many accounts and one account can have many products. That's why so many calls, uh, that's why our call center systems ask you so many uh, questions before getting to the answer. Um, so the first challenge is really to predict the user's accounts and product they're calling about. Here, we use a mix of heuristics and models that leverage call auto, uh, automatic number identification, um, also known as caller ID, uh, mixed with their user, user profile data, support case data that they were previously calling about or had, had other cases open, um, click stream data to predict the user's accounts and product, and present it via voice for user's confirmation. Um, this is not a means of authentication, but rather it's identity prediction to get user to the right solution and or support agent faster. Um, and in the, now in the orange, like in, in the problem prediction phase, we leverage the querulous search model that I described a bit earlier to suggest personalized topics of interest that the users may be calling about. Um, in the solution prediction, we use a mix of the uh, question and answer model and search to provide quick self-help that um, remember that, that, that we could uh, text to the user on the phone to see if that article uh, 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 serves their needs. And finally, while I didn't show it in the diagram here, after solution prediction, we leveraged a custom NLU uh, intent classification model um, for the user self uh, to classify the user's self-reported problem to route the user to the most relevant product specialist or expert to help answer the question. With that, uh, with that brief overview of how conversational experiences work at, at Intuit and some AI models that power those experiences, I'll pass it back over to Greg. Thanks, Horace. Yeah, we are, well, we got through that all pretty fast, actually. We have lots of time for Q and A. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up the presentation here today. Uh, you know, as as with any time that we are are talking to folks uh, from the university, we love to to talk up a few of the job opportunities we have here at Intuit. So I, I can't let the opportunity pass by. So uh, we have a few different areas where you know we're we're hiring for people specifically in our Edmonton office. Uh, if you just want to go to the next slide, there, Horace, I think we can talk through a few of those. So. As I mentioned earlier, we've got representation from a wide variety of teams here in Edmonton. Um, you know, I know Horace's team is looking for, for software developers to help actually build the platform that he was sharing with you here today. Uh, if you or somebody you know is, is interested in conversational experts and, in, uh, and, and, and uh, platforms like this, uh, you know, should definitely reach out. Um, my own world is, uh, as I mentioned, a technology futures world. And so we're doing a lot of work on, uh, you know, data and AI driven experiences. We're doing work in 3D with augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, and we're also doing a lot of work on crypto technologies as well. So if, if anybody is passionate about those areas, you know, we're, we're always looking. And then finally, uh, you know, the majority of the, the people here in our Edmonton office are actually working on our QuickBooks Online product. And so if you're passionate about helping small businesses actually run their business uh, and, and are a full stack developer, Again, please reach out. You know, we would love to we'd love to have you here at Intuit. And so, I think with that, um, we have lots of time for questions. So let's uh, let's open it up and have a chat. Outstanding. Uh, so, Horace, if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, then we can perhaps see some people. I can actually, see. And... <laughs> it's nice to see. <laughs> and Bruce had a couple of questions. We can start with Bruce. Yeah, I, I, I posted them online, but the conversational assistant platform looks really interesting. Is that a tool that you produce that third party people can access or is that just an internal tool? Yeah, it is a platform that we've built in house here. And um, that's great that you asked. Like, uh, there, 
like we have thought of externalizing it in the future. Currently, it is uh, internal only. But like, uh, if there's interest, like uh, we have thought of, there is the thought of externalizing it. So maybe we'll just probably work before we can externalize uh, into the public. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, one or two things, probably. Yeah, one or two things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I mean, it, it works pretty well. I mean, it. I, I, I'd, I'd love to see the architecture, and because I'm working on my own bot architecture, and you know, maybe we could collaborate, but uh see like it like it'd be interesting to see how you handle some of the logic and you didn't really show any of that in the examples i'd love the bert example though i thought that was a great thing my question about the bert uh, my about the bert was first of all can, can you do problem prediction using that same technique or how do you do problem prediction um and then but but a kind of a related question to that is um well actually answer that question then i'll and then i'll ask my other question if, if no one else is asking questions i can take it from a high level and maybe like andrew could uh help in for a, a little bit for the problem prediction we leverage the querulous search um uh, uh, model to like once we have predicted the user that is calling then we look at their um uh, behavior like their user profile and behavior on uh, uh, on the click stream, um, to leverage that to predict, hey, what is the most relevant uh, conversation that they are calling us about, or relevant articles that uh, could be presented to them to potentially help with those problems. Um, Andrew, do you, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, I I also our approach to problem classification is not a um, all or nothing thing. During the user journey, we're learning more and more about the user and what their question might be and sort of narrowing down uh, the exact issue or question they might have. And a lot of these uh, models will sort of pass off to each other. So we have this queryless search uh, model and the whole point is you don't have to type in anything. We know things about you from your behavior. Um, and that might serve up some content that could either um, help to narrow down the question that you're asking or it might um, sort of engage you with another experience that is going to solicit an explicit uh, query. And, you know, that'll engage you with some content that will help to, you know, bring things up that are more relevant to your particular issue. And, you know, if that step doesn't work, we sort of pass you off into an augmented expert. And each step of the way, the problem definition is never a, like, we 100% can, you know, specify all the parameters of your problem. It's sort of narrowing down, characterizing it, and um, hoping to, um, you know, either empower you to find a solution or pass this information off to an expert as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I should... So... Go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I could add color to your first point on the architecture. The, the funny thing is I cut a whole bunch of those slides uh, uh, from this deck because uh, I thought of time. Um, but oh my goodness, <laughs> you, you should schedule another seminar and put them all back in. <laughs> but in terms of fulfillment logic, our finding um, are like at the beginning, uh, a, a lot, like a lot of industry handles the fulfillment logic in a lambda or in code, right? Um, mm -hmm. What we found was the engineers or the developers became the bottleneck of uh, coding yeah. that's like fulfillment logic, and we weren't necessarily the business domain experts on that particular conversation logic that uh, that it um, needed to be offered, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, so we came up with our principle of empowering the design, the business domain expert designer uh, to, uh, to code up that rudimentary logic um, in a no code, low code fashion, uh, yeah, powered yeah. by that CUI designer tool so that they're fully enabled and not bottlenecked by, you know, a, a, a team of engineers where you're writing the specs in, in a JIRA and then the, the engineer is coding up that logic in, in a Lambda or, or, or in a step function, um, something like that. Um, so I think that is one of the highlights of, of the architecture that it is a no-code, low-code platform that allows business domain experts to power these conversational logic. So, so in that conversational logic, there's 
like you you have all these intents do you register intents and then you you register your responses to the intents and this so it's all kind of like dialogue oriented rather than me writing the lines of code like i i do the whole thing through a click point and click interface basically is that sort of the idea yeah pr pretty much uh, so in this tool you could define you know the, define the intents to train an nlu on but once an intent gets classified um then you get you could code a series of logic right of hey mm -hmm. is the user an edmonton or did he talk about um uh, okay. the boilers two turns ago right I, it, so you could perform logic on conversational context as well mm -hmm. as uh, enterprise API data. Like, uh, did this user file for taxes and did they get you know, a refund that's positive or negative, right? Like, like that might all control the conversational, conversational response. Um, and we found that those business logic is actually better done by the business domain person rather than right. a general conversation AI yeah. team. We do have another question in the chat. Um, just quickly, uh, Alex, if you want to ask it, feel free. Otherwise, I can just read it. Uh, I think, Horace, you can see as well. Yes. So, go ahead, Alex. Hello. Sorry, I yes. don't know. Uh, yeah, I was I was curious uh, about well, two two things are pretty um, separate, I guess. One is like what sort of conversational uh, experience, like challenges they're looking to tackle from here on out with the platform. And uh, the other one, the other question I had was uh, while developing these conversational models in particular, was there some technique or a version that you guys upgraded to that was super notable, like a sort of like aha moment where performance metrics really shot up or was it always just kind of like a linear you know, incremental uh, approach. Like there wasn't a silver bullet at any point in time that really like kind of changed your guys' perspective about how to develop the product. Yeah, no, thanks for the questions, Alex. Well, let me uh, take a first crack at the first one. Um, the, the challenges that we want to uh, tackle in the future, uh, there, there's multiple, I think. Um, on, on the experiences side, we want to deliver more do it for me, like task completion type conversations, kind of like that elevating to an expert flow that I, I, I showed you in, um, in, the, T, in the TurboTax uh, assistance demo. We want to do more of that and have less of it uh, uh, need like manual coding of, of offered experience because like, um, uh, anytime we do like a, a deep, per, deeply personalized funnel like that in conversational experiences today, it, it does take a, a material amount of effort. So we want to come up with framework or uh, automation that could uh, uh, help with task completion, maybe leveraging knowledge graphs or, 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 or something similar. Um, the other um, challenges we want to tackle is the scaling of these conversations, scaling and reuse, right? modularity in, in, in within conversational skills and re-leveraging um, uh, a module of conversation that has logic, has a conversational context, and, and be able to be used in multiple bots, multiple places, and in a seamless way so that users don't even you know, perceive you know, the, the, these are modules. Um, so scaling the bots a bit. Um, on the second one, the aha, for, for me, I think uh, the, the Q and A model was an aha, but like the at the beginning we had a hard time handling that long tail of diverse questions. Like we handled the you know first seventy percent of user questions that were you know fairly condensed uh, really well. Like and and we could accomplish those tasks, but the long tail was hard for us. And and the 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 power of uh, Q and A and and some of the you know recent advances in AI like birds. Um, really, really delivered on uh, some business successes here. Um, I'll also, unless Andrew and Greg, do you guys have anything to add? I'll share my yeah. biggest aha oh, moment. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> I raced in, sorry, man. Uh, yeah, the biggest aha moment I had was actually uh, a customer facing outage that we had in the first few months of actually operating the, these bots. This is a few years ago. 
we had a, a service, it was called personalized answers, where essentially it would do a, a lookup of an answer somebody had written for a different purpose, and it would present it on the screen very much like Horace showed that inline answer. And uh, that service crashed at one point, and our contact rates into our call center went through the roof. It was about a 20% increase, I think, in contacts into the call center. And the only thing that had changed was we had gone from this nice inline answer to now back to the search results. So the customer didn't really even know there was anything wrong, but they had to go through the search results and find their answer. That fact, it was a total accident, but it was a really happy, happy accident because it helped convince us that actually this whole business of providing the answer in line in the bot is a game changer, actually. And so we, that's why we invested in the, in the question answering model that you see here today, and, and it has proven to be very effective for us. Uh, you know, it just goes to show that making the user do the work is probably not a great idea uh, and uh, tends to work well otherwise. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll answer the question about um, conversational experiences moving forward in terms of the machine learning uh, horizon. I see a comment here also about uh, massive pre trained neural networks like GPT-3. Um, certainly, that's the direction that um, the natural language space is going into is starting to use these very large pre trained transformer models. Um, I would distinguish between models that are used in a generative capacity. So models that um, will use previous text that they've seen billions and billions of lines of from um, publicly available uh, text and from the internet and just uh, sort of de novo creating new sentences on the fly. Um, I think the, there can be some challenges in terms of providing those um, in a customer facing way because their behavior can be uh, unpredictable and uh, they are um, at inference when in, in real time when you're presenting content to, to customers, they can be a little bit slow. Um, so these generative models, I think um, our current approach is not to present those to customers. Um, but in general, this idea that we can understand a lot about, um, you know, English or other languages by um, having a very large network that has seen a lot of text. Um, can be a great starter point for building machine learning and natural language models that come to the table understanding something about language to begin with. And then we can really target them and focus them in ways that solve specific problems for our customers um, that aren't so open-ended. So um, definitely to your question um, about these large pre-trained models, um, they're, they're becoming more and more in use at Intuit and in the uh, industry at large, and I think they're going to be a part of the future. And so uh, because they're very large, there are challenges in terms of providing them at scale and providing them with uh, good latency guarantees. So a lot of the work that my team is doing now um, includes uh, figuring out how to scale these up and uh, have them be performance when we're presenting them to users. Um, there's also uh, research going on right now in terms of uh, not only understanding things about um, Intuit's content and about our customers um, in these very large networks, but also um, providing retrieved information to these networks that give them a, a good first starting point. So, um, you know, I could talk all day about this, but uh, there's a lot of really interesting research now that we're starting to think about how to incorporate that um, can draw in information um, from Intuit's knowledge base. Uh, Horace talked a little bit about graph representations, but in general, having a, a symbolic starting point, so an ability to pull in information um, that we already fully understand that's not buried somewhere in a network, using that as a starting place um, to uh, have more confidence about what we're gonna present to users and to provide a better experience of that our customers are getting the content that they need that's um, in a, a more um, sort of uh, perfected and more um, appropriate manner. So there's there's a lot of uh, research understanding these very large, like GPT-3, generally what are called transformers or pre-trained networks, and um, providing them in a way that's fast and um, really polished for uh, the best customer experience. Yeah, there's a lot of research happening here. We're, we're going to be doing some work with OpenAI. Uh, I see, Bruce, you also asked about neurosymbolic reasoning. There, we do have a, 
uh, an AI research team that's going to start working and looking more at, at hybrid AI of this kind uh, to see how, we don't have any answers, it's not showing up in products at this point, but it's you know, the kind of stuff that's uh, around the corner. Outstanding. Greg, could you tell us about the origin story of the Edmonton office? Oh, sure. Uh, so yeah, we started here in Edmonton probably, oh man, time flies, it's gotta be 25, 28 years ago, something like that. Uh, let's just round up to 30. I really don't remember the exact time, but uh, we had our two founders, Bruce Johnson and Chad Frederick. Uh, you, some of you may know Bruce. I'm not sure if Chad is around these days so much. Uh, and they had started a company called WinTax uh, to do tax preparation in Windows, as it may, you know, surprise, surprise. And anyway, they did very well, and they had they had founded this all here in Edmonton, uh, just off uh, Coronet Road, just off 51st Ave, or off Argyle Road, I guess, on the south side. And uh, they they were acquired by Intuit, uh, 90 something, uh, I can't remember, 98, 99, something like that. And um, and the, and the rest is history from there. The um, the cool thing was that actually Intuit sort of got the Edmonton office as a as a side deal. Uh, so Intuit was actually in the middle of acquiring a company called Chipsoft that produced the TurboTax product in the United States. And Chipsoft was actually in the middle of acquiring WinTax here in Edmonton. And so uh, the story goes that there was literally negotiations happening in, in conference rooms side by side. And so when it was all said and done, it's like, yeah, congratulations Intuit, you bought Chipsoft. And oh, by the way, we have this little office up in Canada. And and since then, you know, things have taken off. And of course, you know, the entire product line is now running in Canada and it, it serves as a, as a great market for experimentation for the rest of the company. So yeah, that was a good question. It's always a good story. Uh, and of course, you know, people like Chad and Bruce are awesome characters and, you know, so you can always get the history from them if you need it. Outstanding. And that office, uh, you've grown to 125, which is outstanding. So yeah, it's been, we've had our ups and downs. Yeah, we've had our ups and downs. We've, uh, you know, and, and a large part of that growth has come, well, the growth in people has come from U of A mostly. Uh, you know, uh, you, most of us are, are U of A alumni. Um, you know, a few comp bench folks, a few CS folks, a uh, bit of everything actually. Um, from a from the company side of things, the growth has come because we've done an excellent job of delivering for our customers in Edmonton. And we've really, we've built great teams who keep the customer at the center of what we do, which is what Intuit does. I mean, everybody at Intuit does that. Um, but we have always executed extremely well and built a very strong reputation within the company. Uh, that, you know, the leadership knows when, when something needs to get done, you can give it to the Edmonton team and it's, and it's going to get done. Uh, so we've been very proud of that. Outstanding. Russ, did you have something to add? Yeah. So first, great, great conversation, great presentation. I missed a little bit of one part when I, my computer winked out, but when I kept, you kept talking about um, evaluation measures, what are your evaluation measures? Is it customer satisfaction? Is it shaping the driving customers from places? Is it the speed of responses? How do you decide that this is better than that? Yeah, I, I could take that. Um, <clears throat> At a high level, it is uh, in the CUI domain. It is get, like getting the user the information that they they need to you know proceed with their tasks, right? Um, um, and and there, there's multiple measures of that. And and one 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 way we measure is like, hey, did, did the user finally have to elevate to a human expert to to get to get get into you know, to get them the reason uh, the, the solution they need, right? Um, yeah, so so that's one measure of it, and and also like engagements is is, is another common measure of of you know how how the bots is performing. I love that question though. It's a really it's a deep question about how do we understand this latent idea, which is like giving the customer what they need and helping them, you know, to power prosperity. Right in the end, there's this higher level goal, and the different concepts kind of percolate down into what we can actually measure. And sometimes it is a moving target if we find better ways to capture this concept about the customer. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, Horace, I think outlined a bunch of the really good ones, but we're, we're even, we'll innovate internally on finding good measures to be capturing this, um, this experience with the user, the customer. Things like a user didn't need, didn't know he needed this and now he does would be another thing. And you can yeah. go too far and get over, overselling. I don't mean you're doing that, but just can you figure out what the customer wants, what the customer thinks he wants, what the customer does want. There's also issues of 
you, know, you get the answers in five queries rather than 10 queries, right? So lots of different totally. things I've mentioned being subtle. Totally, and you're triangulating across these different measures. So, yeah. um, you know, some of them will give you information on, um, you know, explicitly stated preferences, and then there are implicit preferences. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are, you know, like um, if you provide content to someone which um, drives engagement, are you driving engagement because that's useful content or are you yeah. providing kind of clickbait articles that yeah, people yeah, yeah. will click on and then they're still struggling within the product. It doesn't really resolve their issue. And, you know, all of these can, um, you know, kind of uh, inform the overall goal, which is, uh, are you solving the problems that you want to solve and get you the task? In fact, I think this is a nice tie in uh, over to Greg. Um, this sounds like something a product manager would help define, you know, knowing that the market and, and what the customer is looking for and how patient they are to finding something versus hearing everything versus hearing, you know, yeah. the one targeted answer. We want to talk about uh, that and product management at, uh, at Intuit. Sure, sure. No, I think um, Intuit, we have the notion, uh, we're not unique here, but of, of, the, of a triad or, or sometimes a tetrad uh, group. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a peer group within a, a particular domain. So, you know, you may have uh, a product manager who is, you know, owns the relationship and the, and the customer requirement. You may have the engineering manager or, the, or the, the engineer who is responsible for the solution. So the, the product manager is the what, the engineer is, is the how. Uh, you know, the engineer works very closely with the data scientists who figures out, you know, on, on the specific areas for the AI side of things. And then of course you have your experienced designers. And so that, that tetrad of four uh, kind of move as a herd. If you will, and they, you know, at Intuit, those people that those teams will own a particular set of customer problems, and work together, you know, hand in hand to actually deliver against that. So, you know, the nice thing is, as a, as a global company, we actually have people spread all over the place who can partner together on a day to day basis uh, to actually do this. So, in the case of what what Horace and Andrew have been talking about, I mean, we have product management in you know the Bay Area and in San Diego. We have uh, and of course, a bunch of others. We have uh, our, our data scientists mostly in the Bay Area. We have uh, engineers in Edmonton. Like, you know, it, it's it's a, it's actually great, and you get to you know a, a large diversity of opinions and thoughts in these areas. But standing. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, another question in the chat about um, your origin story it was through an acquisition. On uh, is Intuit looking? to make more acquisitions in Alberta? Do you see anything you like? Is that something that your team um, hears about or how do you scout for that? Or can we make suggestions or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so first off, I definitely can't talk about it because that's like the most secret thing we have uh, is, is acquisitions. But uh, the, the general, I, I get involved in those things a little bit. Uh, we, to answer the question, we do have a venture capital arm. It's actually relatively new. Uh, and so uh, I don't know a whole lot about it. I'm not really in the kitchen on that one, but they do make targeted investments in companies. Our general acquisition strategy is to look for companies that can make a material acceleration in our, uh, in our goals, right? You saw the goals there around, you know, uh, AI-driven expert platform, more money, no work, complete confidence, those kinds of things. If there are companies that can literally like catapult us forward faster than we could build something ourselves, then those become really top priority um, uh, acquisition targets. Uh, you know, beyond that, in terms of specifics, uh, I can't talk about that. <laughs> not that I know, by the way, it's not that I'm withholding you guys, I actually don't know, because they, they again, even within the company, even within senior leadership, those things are held very close. Outstanding. So, of course, we love building um, large tech offices and, and bringing our talent across Alberta tech companies of all sizes. Uh, but do you uh, see much, uh, you know, people from the Edmonton office moving over to other offices and vice versa? You know, life, life at Intuit. If someone goes from U of A, goes through your doors in Edmonton, what, what does the world look like for them? Uh, it's pretty wide open. Uh, you know, the obviously pandemic notwithstanding, uh, Intuit is pretty uh, pretty welcoming of, of teams that are distributed. So you can have people that are based in Edmonton that work, you know, like for example, I'm my team now I'm leading is actually all based in, in the Bay Area. 
Uh, and so I'm a senior leader based in Edmonton, leading teams, again, mostly based in the Bay Area. So that totally happens. We do see people relocating within the company fairly regularly. Uh, you know, I don't always love seeing that, uh, especially when people leave Edmonton, but, it, but it's good, right? It, it's spreading the talent out. And so it's actually very common to hop onto a meeting with colleagues in, you know, in the US, for instance, and it's like, oh yeah, I remember you from, from Edmonton years ago. You, know, you, you went off and did something over here. So you know, there are actually a few people, uh, I know there's uh, at least one vice president in San Diego who used to be based in Edmonton. We know there's, there's senior leaders at the director level and you know, again, who have relocated um, you know, sometimes for personal reasons, sometimes for career reasons, and a bit of everything. Occasionally, we do see some people from the U.S. coming to join us here in Edmonton. Uh, not, not very often. You know, the climate does tend to discourage people a little bit. Uh, Andrew's going to come here, though, right, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's very cool just to see that that Intuit is both a local and a global company, right? right. So you can have the best of all worlds at a time in your career. And then what many people, uh, yeah, you want to explore the world. And then many times people come back because this is um, quite like Alberta as a place to, to raise their family, right? Absolutely. I, I do have something to add to that. Like uh, I, we've had co-ops and, 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 and people that grown up at Intuit and, and moved to the Bay and come back, like you said. I'll, I'll share a personal story. Like I, I'm a U of A grad and, and, and this has been my only like pro, pro job. Um, and I, I feel like working at Intuit, I've grown, I've been able to get a bit of value at home here in, in Edmonton. And it's, it's allowed me and, and leaders like Greg have given me the opportunity to grow up uh, starting at desktop, starting at the basement of web, applied AI, and, and then that led like in image capture stuff and, and, and now in natural language understanding stuff. So, so, so that's an opportunity. Um, uh, it, like internal mobility is uh, highly encouraged here. And, and I've taken a uh, well advantage of that and, and never leaving home in Edmonton here. I, 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 I actually have an interesting comment to add about that. My son, um, Isaac, who worked uh, for, works for Microsoft, he was down in the Seattle area for, you know, for several years. Uh, and then when COVID hit, uh, they let him move to Edmonton. So he now keeps his same job, but he works from Edmonton for Microsoft. You know, he works in a Seattle team, but, but from Edmonton. I mean, this is the new reality that you know, it, it matters very little. Like, I, I, I shouldn't say it matters very little. It matters a lot less where where you're located. So, um, yeah, just an interesting story. Well, and there's many aspects to that, and and the the positive that I really enjoy is that um, Edmonton University of Alberta, Alberta has world class talent, right? Yeah. And so uh, that's attractive to teams everywhere. And Canadians are easier to work with sometimes I hear, but uh, you know, cl clearly we speak a common language across North America and it's really lovely when we saw, have teams that work together uh, at, from every perspective. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank our speakers today and our audience. So to the Intuit team, thank you very much. And Niraj, I don't- Thank you everybody for coming, please. You know, oh. it's, it's, this is great, yes. Thank you. Oh, and especially if anyone is looking for an interesting opportunity uh, locally or globally, uh, do consider into it. Uh, go to their website as well as um, Technology Alberta. Niraj can put you in touch with Greg if you didn't get any of their contact information. It's wonderful to have Intuit active in the industry advisory board at the University of Alberta. It's great to have, again, these world-class companies as part of our everyday. Niraj, anything yeah. you to add? Sure, sure. Uh, feel free to write to me if you want to get in touch with Greg, or if you have any other questions that you would uh, like to get answered, I would be happy to help. And once more, if you want I Love Alberta Tech t-shirts, the link is right above in the chat box. I'll copy paste again. Please sign up there. And uh, I would like thank uh, like to thank Greg, Andrew, and Harris for a wonderful presentation and insightful discussions. After that, it was really great. Thank you so much, Good. and thank thanks you for helping with this organizing all this. Thank you.
thank you everyone for attending today's ai seminar we will see you next week till then stay safe bye bye a pleasure bye everyone thank you